including me. But that's what compromise is. That's consensus. And that's what I ran on. Tonight on the Donlin Report, President Biden makes a deal, but is the White House spending plan going to get people back to work? That's our question tonight, as the president takes a victory lap while pressuring progressives to back his nearly $2 trillion plan. Also, a bombshell from the sheriff investigating the Alec Baldwin movie set shooting. He says in no uncertain terms it was not an accident and is leaving the door open for criminal charges. Plus, take a look at this, a massive protest from New York City firefighters coming out in large numbers against the city's vaccine mandate. We have new numbers tonight on just how many people are quitting their jobs over mandates. That and much more, plus some breaking news tonight involving the former governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo. We'll begin with that as we start with the Donlin Report right now. Great to have you with us. As mentioned, we begin with breaking news. Former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, who resigned amid a series of sexual harassment allegations, is now charged criminally. A misdemeanor complaint has been filed in Albany alleging he forcibly touched a woman last December in the governor's mansion. The complaint putting it this way in graphic language that Cuomo placed his hand under the blouse shirt of the victim and onto her intimate body parts, specifically the victim's left breast, for the purposes of degrading and gratifying his sexual desires. Former federal and state prosecutor Pat Brady joins us now. So, Pat, explain what this means. We see it's a misdemeanor, but it's also a sex crime complaint. How serious is this? Well, a misdemeanor, by definition, he could get up to 60, uh, excuse me, a, a year in jail, not the penitentiary, and then the worst case scenario. But you, you put it in the, in the lead in there. If you actually read the complaint, the allegations in the complaint are pretty bad. I mean, that he actually would do this. This isn't like 10 years ago. This was last December mm -hmm. that he would be that aggressive with the woman. And it led to him being charged. And I, I can't imagine that this will go to trial uh, because I'm sure he doesn't want these facts coming out in a court of law. But this is, even though it's only a misdemeanor, it's certainly he's gone a long way from being a presidential contender to now facing a misdemeanor sex abuse charge. So where does it go then, Pat, if you don't think it leads to jail time and you don't think it leads to a trial? Well, I, can, I just can't imagine that he's going to want to put this out in the public domain about exactly what happened here, what the allegations she made, which would have been su supported, I'm sure, by other evidence, or they, they wouldn't have filed these charges. That's just a bad look for him. But I can't imagine. It. He's, he's a first-time offender. These are serious offense, uh, serious allegations. But I, I doubt he's going to go to jail on us, but on these charges, but his political career is certainly done. Right. Uh, the allegations he faced, Pat, and there were accusations involving 11 women. Why land on this one misdemeanor right now, I guess? And the, the follow-up would be, do you think there are more of these to come? Well, I don't know, but it does. it is a little odd to me that you have this many, you have this big, thorough investigation with a lot of really bad conduct alleged in that investigation that this Albany state court would file these in not a more concerted effort. But you know, you, these cases, the prosecutors take, the, they go where the facts are. They decided to charge him today, and it's really a bad day for uh, former Governor Cuomo. All right. Pat Brady, we appreciate the time. In fact, we're going to have you back a little bit later on in the broadcast to talk about a couple of law enforcement officers who are facing murder charges. So we'll see you with that in just a bit. Great. Thank thanks, you. Joe. Meantime, a political win for President Biden, but is it a win for you and me? More specifically, is it a win for the average family that can't get back to work because of child care issues? That's the pulse of America tonight. President Biden announcing today a framework spending deal with Democrats, his own party, that costs $1.75 trillion. It includes preschool for all three and four year olds, a cap on child care expenses at 7% of your income, and an extension of the tax credit that families receive for each child they have. That impacts about 35 million American households. So what does it mean for you and your family? Now, to be clear, none of this is in stone, but we did some back of the napkin math, if you will, using a hypothetical family of four with two kids ages five and seven with a family income of $100,000. So here's how it looks. That family would pay a maximum of $7,000 per year in child care. They would also get a monthly tax credit for each child, $300 and $250 for the older child. That amounts to $6,600 in cash a year. The president calls that part of the plan historic. 30 years ago, we ranked number seven among the advanced economies in the world as a share of women working. Know where we are today? We rank 23rd. Today, there are nearly 2 million women in America 
not working today simply because they can't afford child care. That's what we want to focus on tonight. A recent study from Fidelity Investments shows 43% of caregivers, almost half, that includes people staying home with the kids, almost half would have to give up their jobs if COVID restrictions continue. That would be a major blow to the economy, which is not growing much as it is. Blame the Delta variant, the mandates, the supply crisis, maybe a combination of all three and more. But the bottom line is the economy grew just 2% over the summer. That's when people are vacationing and supposedly spending money as well. President Biden needs this win, not only for the economy, but for his party, especially with a high profile governor's race getting national attention in Virginia just five days away. We have the political and the economic angles covered for you tonight. Shabani Joshi is here to tell us whether this bill will actually get people back to work. We'll get to Shabani in just a minute. First though, News Nation's Allison Harris at the White House for us tonight. Allison, we've been watching this develop in DC all day. And the question has been, will the progressives torpedo this over the things they want, or are they on board? Where does that stand tonight? Well, Joe, it seems that progressives are the holdup here. That's where things stand right now. Progressives seem to like the framework. They want to read the fine print, and they're sending the message that they are only going to vote on this bipartisan infrastructure bill if they also at the same time can vote on this spending plan for the president. The president today not so much speaking to the American people, but speaking to these progressives when he said this is about compromise and consensus. That ha that is how you get deals done. It seems like they might be willing to compromise to agree with this new 1.75 trillion dollar plan. The only consensus among these progressives including the squad right now is that they are all together and that they have to link these plans and get a vote on both to be able to vote on either one, even just the infrastructure bill which the president and Pelosi wanted a vote on. Uh, today. Now, earlier today, Senator Bernie Sanders had said that he wanted to see the legislative text on this at Pelosi's press conference this afternoon. She kind of unexpectedly dropped that legislative text saying, here's the 16, more than 1,600 pages of that. That is now being reviewed by these progressives. And I think something that has stuck with me today as we're seeing this happen is something that the press secretary said earlier this week. I think she was reiterating something that Speaker Pelosi had said, which is don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good essentially saying we know that progressives want that ideal three and a half right. trillion dollar plan that we started out with but this could still be historic and transformative at 1.75 trillion dollars it could still be the largest uh, initiative to combat climate change in american history so we still could see this come together progressives setting a statement this uh, this evening saying that they want to finalize this but they are linking those two bills saying they're only going to vote on that together Joe? Why is that, Allison? Why the importance of linking the infrastructure and this spending bill together? Are they worried that if they pass infrastructure first, they may not get what they think they're going to get out of this spending bill? It is simple, Joe. They do not trust Senator Manchin and Senator Sinema. And both of those two senators today have said kind of vague, positive statements, but not full-throated endorsements of what the president is trying to do with this new $1.75 trillion plan. However, we all know Manchin and Sinema have been talking with the president, meeting here at the White House mm -hmm. for weeks now, especially this week. So we believe they're on the same page for this new plan, but progressives just don't trust that they're going to get what they want if they vote on infrastructure now, without the full right. text, the full agreement of vote on the floor on this other plan. Any idea, Allison, just uh, your gut on when this vote might happen? The president said today when he met with Democrats that his presidency rests on getting this done in the next week. Possibly now that we see he really forced this deadline today, maybe we'll see it. We know they're working over the weekend. Maybe we'll see it early next week. All right. Great update for us tonight at the White House. Allison Harris, it's good to see you. Thanks for the time. Let's go now Thank to you. business journalist Shivani Joshi. Uh, Shivani, there's a lot to dive into here. Let's talk about the financial aspect of this. And we'll start with the question, are these child care issues and the changes, are they enough to get people back into the workforce, do you think? I believe it is a great start. You know, that's something that I feel passionately about and something that I've come on your program um, talking about is the crisis happening with working women right now and something that I've experienced personally with three kids under 10 and having to homeschool them and do everything else that I do. Um, we have women leaving the workforce continued in droves, hundreds of thousands out of the workforce in September. Um, we have women's participation rates in the labor force at a 30 year low. 
and any woman, and probably even in your own household, um, you know that this is an issue for all parents. So doing things that are supportive of parents in general, but also women, um, is going to be a crucial step in, in regaining our economic strength. You need, we had a, a workforce that was uh, almost near 50-50 in terms of participation by gender before the pandemic, and now we've come down significantly, significantly from that. So these policies specifically relating to child care and and tax credits and universal um, preschool mm -hmm. Um, is huge for women. It will take some time, but this is, it's a step in the right direction. I know you've talked about women in particular, Shivani, but I'm wondering as they look at this, especially the child care, no more than 7% of your salary, is that enough for women in particular to say, okay, yeah, now it's worth it to go back, or is it a push? Well, one of these things that one of the terms that is not in there is a family medical leave. And that is something that also a lot of women are, are up in arms that it was one of the things on the chopping block in this latest version of this proposal. And that is something that the United States versus other countries uh, in the world uh, lags behind in terms of supporting uh, people of all genders um, in terms of being able to take necessary leave. And during the pandemic, we saw that was even more crucial. So I think these um, supportive policies are a Start. They are not what they need to be to get women um, entirely off of the fence and back into the workforce. But this is certainly something that will make it more interesting. And that 7,000 cap is tremendous. I mean, I live in the Bay Area where child care costs are overwhelming, overwhelming for all income levels. And these um, steps are very supportive to start to take the burden off of women, to free them up, to allow them to enter the workforce, which is what we need to regain our momentum. Shabani, let's hit some COVID issues because we saw this protest today in New York at the mayor's residence and it was large. You can see these numbers here. They're protesting the mandates in New York City. How much of an impact do you think what we're seeing with the mandates and the people leaving their jobs will impact the economy? You know, it's hard to say. I think that's one of the things that we're seeing these protests. We don't know if this is actually uh, translating into uh, job losses. A uh, Kaiser survey says that um, something like 33% of unvaccinated workers will quit their jobs if they are being forced to uh, have the vaccine mandate. But what it actually translates into, according to the same report, is that actually probably fewer than 5% end up doing it. So a lot of people say, yes, I will not tolerate this. Um, but when it comes push comes to shove, they don't actually do it. But they have um, a lot of choices. As we've talked about, Joe, many times, mm -hmm. this is a job seekers market. So right. if you do not want to uh, d get vaccinated, there are now um, job sites and, and, and groups out there that are, are promoting um, jobs that do not force you to get vaccinated to take them. And they're often in employers that um, have fewer than 100 people. Um, but there are other options out there. And so long as they remain, we're going to have this uh, divisiveness and, 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 and alternatives for people who don't want to get vaccinated. And the record number of job openings. And not to mention, I mean, in August, you had four and a half million people nearly who quit their jobs. I, I'm, I guess my, my point is, are we underestimating the impact that COVID is still having on the workforce right now? Yes, I believe so. I think this is just another one of the ripple effects and the tentacles of the, of the COVID monster. Um, you know, the, getting people tested by employers, the cost is tremendous. I mean, it costs on average about $148 to administer the test. Who's going to foot the bill for that? If, if it's the employer, it's eventually going to get passed on to the customer, to the end product. And to do this on a systematic basis, to do it on a regular basis, because that really is the only other alternative alternative to forcing vaccination mm. is to do regular testing. The costs are enormous. Um, but it also, if you don't force um, uh, em employees to get vaccinated, it also taxes employees in the healthcare system with right. uh, hospitalizations costing up to $100,000. So either mm. way you turn, there is a huge, tremendous cost that um, comes with it. Right. Uh, just a quick note to uh, the Washington Bureau just let us know that there will be no vote on this package today. Or this week. So that is some new news that broke just as we went on the air here tonight. Business journalist Shivani Joshi, always great to have you. Thank you. Thank you. A bombshell admission from the sheriff investigating the Alec Baldwin movie set shooting. This was no accident, and they're looking into it as a criminal matter. What does that mean for the three people who handled the gun? Our prop expert and stunt scientist comes on next. He has a replica of the gun used on the set of Rust. 
Plus, more businesses, including McDonald's, using robots instead of workers. What does that mean for the American workforce and the American consumer? I'll ask John Taffer if eliminating some payroll will help lower prices. And a little girl killed by a state trooper after he rammed into and flipped the car she was in. He's now facing murder charges. Pat Brady back later this hour to discuss. Is there a gray area for prosecutors when charging police with murder? Don't forget, you can follow us on social media at The Donlin Report on Twitter. New details are emerging from last week's deadly shooting on the set of Alec Baldwin's latest movie. The fatal shot fired by Baldwin himself killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins and injured the director, Joel Souza. Here's what the Santa Fe County Sheriff told Fox News this morning when the host referred to the incident as a tragic accident. So just to back up to what you just said, are you saying it's too early to call it an accident? So just to back up to what you just said, are you saying it's too early to call it an accident? I wouldn't, as of right now, I wouldn't call it an accident at all. It's a criminal investigation. He, he wouldn't call it an accident. And that leads to what else happened today. The sheriff says they're focusing on three people, including the assistant director, David Halls, who admits in an affidavit to not fully checking the revolver before handing it to Baldwin. Today, we're also learning actor Nicolas Cage reportedly stormed off the set of an earlier film where the armorer, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, was in charge of weapons after she fired a gun without warning near cast and crew twice in three days. Joining me now to talk more about this are movie stunt scientist Steve Wolf and attorney Stuart Frankel. Stuart, let's start with you, if I could, and this whole talk of it not being an accident or being careful referring it to as an accident, because some might hear that and think, well, that might give some the uh, impression that this was intentional. Well, I don't think it would be considered intentional. You don't have to have an intentional act to have a crime. I mean, I want to remind our viewers what involuntary manslaughter is. It's an unintentional killing occurring while acting without due care or circumspect, mm -hmm. circumspection. So we're not talking about an intentional act for it to be a crime. Right, that's, that's a great point. That's what I needed from you. But at the same time, unintentional sure seems to fit the bill here, does it not? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there are really two questions that we need to ask and what the district attorney is asking and the sheriff is asking is, how did a round get into that weapon, number one? And number two, why didn't anybody figure out that there was a live round in that weapon? These are the two most important questions in this case and in this investigation. Steve, you've been so great at bringing some of your props on and explaining to us visually how this worked and how it possibly went down. And I understand you, you've you obtained a working copy of the gun that was actually used in the scene. So walk us through what you've learned now that you have it in your hands. Yeah, as, as if someone would say, the movie you shot that with this gun was no good, but the movie you shot that with this gun was really good. Mm -hmm. These guns look the same, right? One of these is a real gun, one of these is a prop gun. One of these can accept live ammo, one of these can't. This is the prop gun. And as, as I've shown you, you know, if you try to put real ammo into this with a bullet on the end of it, you know, it simply won't go in. So why, given the opportunity to use a gun that looks just like the other gun, but can't kill anyone, why wouldn't you use it? So which one the, was this it, Steve? The real was... gun. Go ahead. Yeah. This one's the this one's the real gun, and we can take this 45 volt ammo and put that right in there. And now this is this is lethal, and this is what they used on this set unnecessarily because these things are just as available, mm. and they don't kill anyone. So while it is certainly possible to use real guns on set, why would you do it when you don't have to? Why would you do it when you could get a prop gun? If there's some reason that it's you know this one of a kind gun, it's the only right. thing you can get. All right, use it, have it modified, have someone watching to make sure that, you know, you're not putting real ammo in it that could kill people. But, you know, if someone got run over on the set, they're not going to say, we shouldn't allow cars on set anymore. We'd say, we have to make sure that people who operate these things operate them safely. Right. Stuart, uh, Baldwin himself posted a story pointing to David Halls, the assistant director we've talked about, uh, reportedly telling inspectors he should have inspected each round in each chamber, which it sounds like he didn't do at this point. 
Where does this fall in the investigation when it comes to negligence and whatever else you would be looking into? Well, what we have to look at are what are the industry standards? Unfortunately, there are no mandated firearm safety practices and procedures mm -hmm. mandated by AFTRA, SAG, uh, IASA. They should be. I mean, there actually should be. And there are some safety protocols out there, and there are some gold standards that are used in the industry, but nothing is mandated. Here, if you look at the gold standard practice and procedures, the assistant director should never have ever touched that weapon. It was not Mr. Hall's job mm -hmm. duty responsibilities. It was the armor's responsibility to hand the weapon to the actor to show the actor that it was safe. And it's the actor's responsibility to ensure that he is getting a safe weapon before he uses it for the shot that they're about to do. Steve, we just have about 10 <laughs> seconds left. But quickly, yeah, just talk about the chain of possession of this gun. That's absolutely right. One person handles the gun. They load it, they check it, they clear it, they hand it to the actor, they show the actor that it's safe, the actor uses it, that same person takes the gun, same gun back and puts it in the safe. They don't leave it out on a table for people to go right. planking behind the set with. All right, Prop Master Steve Wolf and Attorney Stuart Frankel, great to have you both again tonight. We appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. Could a robot be taking your job? If you work at McDonald's, it's possible why the fast food giant is turning to robots. We're going to talk to someone who knows a thing or two about restaurants. Bar Rescue's John Taffer, who's already made the switch to some automation. Plus, one man who applied for 60 entry-level jobs but says he only got one interview. What's going on with that? We'll talk to him ahead. Tonight, what's working and what's not working? Many businesses are having a hard time finding employees, especially those in the service industry. A new study by Indeed shows since the pandemic, fewer people are applying to service and warehouse jobs and more are applying to higher paying jobs like those in tech and media. Here's how businesses are adapting. According to a study by Verizon, 30% of small businesses say they've already started adopting digital tools and automation to replace tasks usually done by people. McDonald's has teamed up now with IBM to develop automated drive throughs Think Watson taking your order for the Big Mac there. And also luxury retailer Saks is pairing its human workers in warehouses with robots to get through the holiday rush. Joining me now, host and executive producer of Bar Rescue and our old friend John Taffer. John, it's good to see you. I know the first time you and I talked, you said you'd already gone to some automation in your taverns. What is this doing to the workforce, do you think? Well, it, it, it's it's we have to find solutions as employers. You know, I'm sitting here, Joe, in Las Vegas, and a lot of the hotels are understaffed by 20, 25 percent. Policies have been changed. Procedures have been changed. Digital technology, automated technology. And they're learning how to operate the hotels with 20 percent less employees. Business has to find solutions. We can't stop, Joe. So in my Taffer's Tavern concept, we have all automated cooking systems, computerized reservation systems and such. So we were a little bit ahead of this, but the restaurant industry is different. The restaurant industry has had labor issues for a long, long time. Right. Back when Trump was president, we had major labor issues back then when unemployment was so low. So the restaurant industry has been looking at kiosk programs and automated cooking systems and such for a long time. The pandemic greatly accelerated that process. I've seen where, you know, they're using robots to deliver the food. Uh, I guess my question, I didn't know, John, that you had that much automation in there. So give me an idea. How many employees did you used to have and how many do you have now with all this automation? Well, we found in a restaurant business, the problem was the kitchen, not the front of the house, that not only finding employees for the kitchen was difficult, but kitchen positions are intensive training jobs, Joe. It takes a lot of training to get food prepared to yeah. specification and presented correctly. So the turnover of employees was also a major issue. Our goal was through automation to reverse the la uh, reduce the labor in the back of the house by 60 percent. And we did. So wow. a kitchen that would normally have five or six employees we have two. Wow. All right. So how many, I mean, big picture that for us, John, because if you extrapolate that out, how many real life workers do you think get impacted ultimately by this shift over to automation? 
Well, you know, it's interesting. Many restaurant companies that aren't doing automation are cutting back everywhere to make labor numbers work today. So restaurants are cutting in the front of the house and the back of the house. Because I put in the technology in the back of the house, I added employees in the front of the house okay. to create for a better dining experience. So for me, it wasn't the saving of employees as much as the relocation or reallocation of employee assets to provide a guest experience. Also, the automation reduced my training burden hugely, Joe. What would take me five, six days of training is now five, six hours of training. Plus the product is more consistent. Restaurant ticket times are traditionally 12 minutes. We run six minutes. Hmm. I mean, there's a lot of benefits to the automation process. Yeah, does that though in the end get passed on to the customer though, John? Because I know there are other things we've talked about and that is increasing prices and costs and supply chain issues. Does the customer ultimately pay, you know, does it pay off for the customer? Well, you know, it's interesting. Beef prices, for example, have gone up a total of about 24%. If I have a $10 hamburger, Joe, I can't just charge $12.40 for that hamburger overnight. Customers are going to resist. So I have to keep my food prices still attractive. I have to pick up in other areas. So having this automation and having these efficiencies are allowing me to keep my food prices in line because I'm picking up a few points on that side as well. The consumer wins on this deal. They win in speed. They win in efficiency, they win in prices, and they win in consistency. Do you worry at all, John, that we're, we're essentially automating, I don't know, tens of thousands, maybe even more of jobs that, that'll never come back? You know, I would be, Joe, but I remember when computers came out and everybody said, oh, this is the end. Everybody's going to lose their job. That wasn't the case. For example, we have a computerized bartending system called Evo that we're working on. It's a robotic bartender. It makes 200 drinks, all of them in four seconds each. Mm. I'm going to put a person to operate that machine who has a wonderful personality. Yeah. So I didn't eliminate an employee okay. because of this robot. I chose a different type of employee now. I don't have to hire them for their drink making skills. I can hire them for their personality and right. other attributes. Yeah, I was that wondering. really enhances my business and the customer experience. Yeah, I was wondering if the robot told jokes, but there you go. You still have the person there to do that, right? So, Absolutely. John, tell us quickly before we go uh, about the show and what you're working on and what you're seeing out there on the streets. Are people opening restaurants and bars in this climate or are they having trouble hanging on to what they have? Well, I got to tell you, we're selling franchises like Hell for Taffer's Tavern. That's a pretty good indicator for us. Landlords are being very aggressive right now. The average restaurant is up about 25% over last year. Fast food restaurants are experiencing that. Full service restaurants are experiencing that. So it's sort of a boom town in the restaurant industry. Mm. If we could just have the labor you know, to, to realize this boom town. But revenues are up everywhere, Joe. It's actually a decent time for the industry. Our challenge is costs and labor. Yeah. All right, it's always great to get your voice on these issues, John, because we know you're in the thick of it. That's the host and executive producer of Bar Rescue, John Taffer. It's good to see you again, John. Good to see you, Joe. Be well. You may want to stick around, John, because this next guest uh, you might want to hire. Because amid the <laughs> struggling hiring headlines, there's a man in Florida who's taken it upon himself to conduct an experiment. He says he applied to 60 entry-level jobs and only got one interview. Joining me now, the man who conducted the experiment himself, Joey Holes. Joey, it's great to have you. So how did this come about? What, what were you looking for when it came to this job search? Were there specific things you were uh, isolating to, to uh, go after? Uh, yes, I only applied for jobs between eight sixty-five an hour, which was the minimum wage at the time this study started, and $12 an hour. And I'm currently employed with an office in Key West, so I did this strictly for fun and sort of out of spite because of the conversation that nobody wants to work. I went out to prove that people are putting in applications and they're not getting responses. So that doesn't match with the story I've been hearing. So what kind of jobs did you approach beyond just what the pay was? Give us an example. Uh, well, restaurants, there were a couple of low paying construction gigs, data entry, but most of these applications went right into the restaurant industry, which as we just heard, is a booming industry, yet they're still trying to pay eight sixty-five an hour to their employees with no benefits in part time. So the the workers are there, but the restaurants don't want to sacrifice the profits to meet the employees where they need their wages to take care of their families. So uh, it, I'm sure people will watch this and think, well, you know, maybe you weren't qualified for some of these things, or maybe you were overqualified for some of them. How many did you hear back from? 
Uh, I only heard back from 16 of them. And via what did they email. say? Four of those turned. Uh, it was either the generic "thank you for submitting your resume" email. A couple of them moved forward to phone calls. Four of them did. One of those turned into an interview. Um, I used to do recruiting, so my resume was specifically tailored for each job. I write a new resume for each job I apply for because that's just the best way to do it. So w why do you think you didn't get more response from these? Because the chorus of no one wants to work and we can't find employees is the way you keep the people who have been there throughout the pandemic doing three people's jobs without raises. That's how you keep them doing that you know it'd be like no i've got help on the way i'm trying to find it but nobody wants to work you know yeah and uh, i i think that was uh that rang hollow and that's not what i experienced when i put out these applications what does your current boss think about you looking for all these new jobs <laughs> oh he knows that i'm not leaving him okay he takes care of me well he pays me well i'm not going anywhere when an employer takes care of their people they don't leave and uh so Mike's got nothing to worry about. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Joey Holtz, thanks for the time. We appreciate it. Good to hear your uh, insights on what's happening out there as well. Take care. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. A school officer in California charged with murder after firing shots into a car, killing an 18 year old. What is the legal threshold needed to charge an officer with murder? We'll talk about that along with an 11 year old girl killed by a state trooper after the trooper rammed and flipped the car she was in that trooper also facing murder charges so did he cross the line is there a gray area here we'll talk with our prosecutor pat brady next Now to two stories where law enforcement officers are facing murder charges. The first involving a school safety officer in Long Beach, California. That officer accused in the shooting death of 18-year-old Mona Rodriguez. She was a passenger in a car that was leaving the scene of a fight. The officer, Eddie Gonzalez, fired two shots at the car as it drove away, killing Rodriguez. Joining me now, former federal and state prosecutor Pat Brady. So, Pat, what goes into a murder charge in a case like this? especially where, at least at this point, they haven't yet determined the degree, right? What does all that mean? Well, there's different degrees of, of murder charges, but the, the th first thing you look at is this a justified use of force by a police officer. Supreme Court's laid out what the standard is, but every state is different. California just amended their law. It's an objective standard of reasonableness. Okay. If you look at this, this guy, uh, not even an officer here, opened up immediately when this car took off and started firing. His life was not in danger. I don't believe, for, if you look at the, the video here, that anybody else's life was in danger or, or a threat of great bodily harm. So certainly this seemed to be a justified charge, at least some kind of, some degree of murder. This brings up the point. I, I think the school district, which fired the officer, said... Immediately. You're not supposed to fire at a fleeing person or vehicle except as a final means of defense and as as you point out it appears the car is pulling away and not even really necessarily at him yeah there's no and it's very this is oversimplification but you can defend yourself or defend someone else if you're a, a peace officer in this case like you said the car is driving away something out of the wild west and it's not like this is some felon that's just committed a violent offense it's not pablo escobar this is just some random kind of street nonsense and this guy just opens up right so that brings the question is there a gray area pat if you're a prosecutor on a case like this i mean there was a fight to your point the officer used pepper spray to break up the fight and then this as they're driving away and and this is an sro so i think this involves students although this the the girl who died the young woman who died i should say was not apparently a student at the time yeah i mean there's it's not necessarily a gray area, but the prosecutor takes the facts and you apply the law to those facts. And the facts are always different in some, to some degree. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it doesn't seem to me that it's even a close call. And, and this, they looked, it appears, and I don't have all the facts in front of me, but it appears they made the right call in charging. What do you think? Particularly Bert? in California, it's got an objective, reasonable standard. There's five videos of what happened here, and objectively, this does not look mm -hmm. reasonable. All right, let's talk about another case here, Pat, because this one's come from uh, New York and you, you probably heard about this trooper who pulled over a driver for speeding. And then there was pepper spray used in this case as well. The driver takes off, and then the officer rams the car twice, ultimately flipping the car and killing an 11-year-old girl in it. Now he's facing murder charges as well. It appears to be the proper charging. I mean, 
a little bit of background for this. This is the third time this officer has taken a police car and rammed someone like this. Now, I don't know what the reason for the pepper spray was. Maybe there was a gun there, but it certainly appears reasonable that this officer should have been charged. Police officers have a great responsibility. They can use deadly force, but it has to be justified. And it's a pretty fine line of things that they, that, it's, that substantiate that justification. So, I mean, these look like good calls, but let's take the flip side of this. These are split second decisions that police officers have to make. So I think this in this era of defund police and everybody's on the police about bad conduct by some officers, these are tough, tough calls. And I think this not supporting police makes the situation worse. These two, though, maybe not necessarily good cases uh, to point to. Oh, I'm not. I'm, that's right. what I'm saying. That, that's the difference, I think, now maybe a couple years ago. Derek Chauvin up there in Minnesota, who did the George right. Floyd, he's going to be in penitentiary for a long time. And police officers came out and testified against him which you didn't see a long time ago. This was everybody doing the right thing and he's in the penitentiary, but the overwhelming number of police officers are good, solid citizens, just want to get home and see their families. Right. You gotta remember these are, and I talked to some police officers today about these cases. This happens quickly. These are, there's a lot of adrenaline flowing. These are adrenaline flowing. These are split second decisions. So they are, like you say, gray area, they're tough cases. What about the, uh, this incident? You mentioned the officer, the trooper in 17 and 19 had similar cases, but the indictment now, as I understand it, includes the 2019 incident. How does that happen? Um, well, again, you go where the facts are. I don't have all the facts that the New York prosecutors had in, in charging. And there must have been some facts that tied these together. Maybe some statements she made, he made, maybe some statements others made. But, mm. but I, I can't imagine, knowing a lot of police officers and having worked for 10 years as a prosecutor, that there's three incidents that you should be taking your police car, which could be a deadly instrument, sure. and ramming somebody. In this case, somebody got killed. All right. Um, held without bail, too, this trooper is. Although I understand the hearing is scheduled for next week. Why is that? Potential flight risk. The reason, really? you, yeah, a true that point? maybe that's the argument you make. Maybe it's it's so egregious that the, the judge got mad. But that's up to the the judge makes the determination on bond. And there are factors in each state which are different. Usually, it's flight risk or, or, or threat to society. I imagine he'll get out, but it'll be a high bond. All right, Pat Brady. Thanks again for your insight. Now to the latest on what's being called the mother of all migrant caravans. It's headed toward Mexico City and then onto our southern border. Joining me now for more on this, Marky Martin. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the momentum it seems to be gaining, Marky, and the latest today. Hey, Joe, so this weekend, this caravan was made up of 2,000 migrants. It is now 4,000 people deep, and they left from Tapachula, Mexico, right there on the border with Guatemala, and they've only made it about 40 miles north. Uh, so they have a long way to go before they get to Mexico City before they get to the United States. Uh, but you're right, this is growing larger by the day. In fact, one immigration activist likened it to a magnet. He said it's just sucking up people as it moves through towns along the way. This is the largest group of migrants to move through southern Mexico since the pandemic began. And in this group, you have 400 children, about 100 babies, 65 pregnant women. And we showed you this video just a few nights ago. Mexico's National Guard, has really now realized how outnumbered they are here. Take a look at this video. Uh, the other night, a roadblock plowed through by thousands of migrants. No match for them, so they didn't pursue them. They did not draw weapons. And since this incident, Joe, the Mexican National Guard has not tried to intervene. And lastly, one of the most um, maybe surprising elements is just how organized these caravans are becoming. This one reportedly has QR codes that these migrants are scanning to communicate, to get more information to figure out where everybody's moving. And a former ICE special agent that I talked to this week said we will only see these groups get larger and more sophisticated from here. And Joe, his um, prediction was that before the end of the year, we see 80 to 100,000 more migrants come here to the United States. All right, Joe. Marky Martin, thank you very much. On Balance with Leland Bitter, it starts at the top of the hour. Leland joins us now. What do you have? Hey, we're picking up on the immigration theme. So remember all those kids who were separated at the border and kept in cages right. and turned out a huge scandal? The Biden administration is now talking about giving each one of the families $450,000 in settlements, in pain and suffering settlements because of that. Our guest tonight is Chad Wolf, who was then the DHS secretary, right. acting secretary, to come on and talk about this and sort of what standard should be used, whether this money really needs to be paid, and then also what precedent it sets if all of a sudden you follow the law and then the government's paying $450,000. How many people potentially 
would get this payout. Thousands. So thousands of kids who are separated. A lot of money. Yeah. All right, we'll see you with that at the top of the hour. And one other quick programming note. Don't forget, you can tune in to tonight's special coverage of Gabby Petito's Final Days, a News Nation Prime special right here, 9 Eastern, 8 Central. Back after this. It's been nearly two months since Gabby Petito was reported missing. Her remains later discovered near the Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. And then last week, the remains of her boyfriend, Brian Laundry, still considered by many a prime suspect in her murder, were found in a Florida nature preserve. Since the beginning of the investigation, this has captured the attention of the nation. And I'm joined now by News Nation's Brian Enton, who's retracing Gabby Petito's final steps for us tonight. Brian? Yeah, Joe, you know, it's been interesting because we've been live in Florida for the last six weeks outside the Laundry family home. And now for the last several days, we've been in Utah and Idaho and now Wyoming. You mentioned it, retracing Gabby Petito's last steps um, today, uh, really sort of an emotional day. We went into Grand Teton to the exact spot where they found uh, Gabby's body. Uh, you remember the van was first spotted by the bloggers off of a dirt road about a thousand feet from there. It's a little bit of a hike. We had to go through like a small river. Uh, we found the spot where the body was. There's now a stone cross there uh, that Gabby's stepdad left. I uh, would include all of this tonight in our special uh, at, at nine o'clock Eastern. Brian, one other note, as I understand, you were able to retrace the steps uh, of this diner where they apparently were uh, just shortly before Brian laundry returned to Florida. What did you find there? Yeah, so this was actually uh, in Jackson, Wyoming, a restaurant which was the last place that Gabby and Brian were spotted. And we spoke with the manager. And, you know, there have been other reporters that have, have had reports about this place. And what was interesting is the first thing the manager told us is all the other stories are wrong. Uh, and basically, we want to set the record straight and talk about what we actually did see inside the restaurant uh, with Brian and Gabby. It was really interesting. Uh, and we're going to have all of that tonight. Well, all right. Well, we'll look forward to that. Brian Enton, thank you. Tonight. Tonight and for all the work you've been doing on this case. As Brian mentioned, don't forget, tune in to tonight's special coverage of Gabby Petito's final days, a News Nation Prime special right here at 9 Eastern, 8 Central, again on News Nation. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact driven, unbiased coverage.